I'd like to welcome tonight's um, speaker, Peter Burgess. Peter is the Director of Conservation and Development at Devon Wildlife Trust. And tonight's talk is all about the meadows that um, Devon Wildlife Trust have restored over the years. Um, you'll be learning about survey and how you monitor the meadows. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm really looking forward to it, actually, because um, you have got a lot of um, species-rich grasslands, haven't you, yeah, in the reserves. Um, and you're also doing private land as well, resowing on, on private land, which is really interesting. So, without further ado, I'll hand you over to Peter. Thank, Thank you very much, Thank you. Thank you. Um, 
I take a bit more of a relaxed view on, on what meadows are, especially in Devon because our geology is so varied. Um, you know, it really is around where we've got grassland dominated habitats um, that are really species rich um, and that are managed in a, a traditional way which maintains them for the future. Um, and we are a super diverse county. You know, up there on the top left, we've got Cretaceous chalk. Um, yeah, not many people know that we've got those chalk grasslands in Devon. We've got outcrops of limestone down in South Devon. We've got the Triassic sandstones. Uh, a whole variety of different rocks which give rise to a whole variety of different land uses. Um, so we've got Bronze and Burrows down there on the, on the bottom left. Um, if anyone has not visited Broughton Burrows in late May, early June, you're missing out on an absolute treat. I mean, it's one of the most species rich. I've heard it's the most species rich parish in the whole of the country. Uh, and that's largely down to Broughton Burrows. Um, you have swathes of early marsh orchids, southern marsh orchid, um, it's, uh, it's marsh helleberine, it's an absolutely stunning place. Um, up on the top right there, we've got our sort of heathy, more rushy pastures. Um, and that's something that Devon is, is really well renowned for, full of their heath, heath spotted orchid. Um, but we shouldn't forget some of our upland <coughs> and the different upland cuts, actually. You know, we've got two uplands in the county. Uh, and then <coughs> the very specific climatic conditions that are there, the geological conditions, the soil conditions, give rise to a whole variety of different habitats, often very acidic. Um, but yeah, there's not many places I think in the country where you can get scenes like that, um, probably in about a month's time, depending on what the weather does. Um, so diversity in Devon is phenomenal, and that is what uh, part of the interest is. You can drive, try five miles to go from chalk into acid habitats and see a completely different range of grassland communities. Uh, jewels in the crown, really, are low, lowland, really species-rich hay meadow. Um, there's not much of this left now, but where we do have it, it's, it's a real treasure. Um, and then getting into the upland situation. So here we've got um, great butterfly orchid, um, southern marsh orchid, and there, there definitely is in there um, moonwort. Sorry, I'm almost forgetting some of my species. It's getting rusty because it's towards the end of the, end of the season. Uh, but that, that's up a fruits farm. And you get the pleasure of being able to visit that in, uh, in June. And it's one of the most fabulous sites that I, that I think I've seen. Um, you don't recognise, or you, you certainly it's not um, a habitat that you recognise that is typically Dartmoor. Uh, but you, know, you get into those hay meadows and you think that that would have been a habitat that would have stretched really as far as the eye would seen in most of the in-by land. Um, so it's magnificent that we've still got these, uh, these areas that remain. Um, dropping off the moor, this is just one of our na nature reserves at Andrews Wood. Yeah. Um, often it's easiest to talk about the orchids because they're the showiest things for the those at the back of the room. But the, these are, again, really diverse acid grasslands, um, really magnificent for the amount of uh, you know, pollinating plants that are there. And um, yeah, we've got Heath Lavidia, it's one of the few sites in the whole country where Heath Lavidia is found. Um, and it's, yeah, it's stunning plant. Uh, and we've taken on land which, uh, and there's a fair bit of this in, in the county, in, in quite unusual locations. This is the top of a spoil heap. Um, we call it Team Grace Meadow. So this is opposite where BCT tiles used to have the fog of steam coming up. Um, so there is life after the minerals, and there is some, often some very stunning habitats that are after the mineral sites. Um, you know, these are areas which have had that sort of piecemeal management over a period of time, sort of benign neglect in some areas, and, and wildlife finds a way in those areas, and often really does actually thrive. Um, and since we've taken that on, you know, we, we, we've got to do some management to get that back into tip-top condition. Um, this is one of the scenes of some marsh tucked under the pylons. Uh, that's what we want it to look like. Um, I shouldn't talk about counties outside of Devon, but this is a a special place that's Clattinger Farm in Wiltshire. If you ever get a chance to see it, they're, they're all uh, green winged orchids. It's a lovely place, but they are um, glimpses of that in Devon, in the Teen Valley, um, around Teen Grace and Teen Grace Meadow. There are meadows full, full of green winged orchids, they're 
absolutely stunning. Um, and there are, are things in quirky places as well. Um, I've been known to put on reflective jacket and pretend that I'm highways and go down the A38 road verges. It's probably not something that I would recommend, especially because I'm on camera. Um, but yeah, then walking the road verges on, uh, around Devon, um, you do see some, some stunning plants. And uh, yeah, things like bee orchids uh, can be in profusion. You've just got to keep your, keep your eye out. But they, these bee orchids are actually in, uh, alongside the car park in the Met Office in Exeter. Uh, and that east of Exeter area is a bit of a hotspot again for us. Mm -hmm. Some really nice species there. And uh, you just have to have one person who's got a bit of an eagle eye. And uh, you know, they go out and put their canes out and protect them against the sort of the contract mowing that happens in these areas and, uh, and do a great job. But yeah, don't do when you're going around the county, keep your eyes open because um, there's another place in Exeter, the Tesco's, I don't know if you, you know, very large Tesco's near Pines Hill. Uh, all the banks along that Tesco's car park are full of peel kids. Uh, and you would just, oh gosh, I've got to go shopping, and just ignore what's all around you. And some of these places have got these glimpses of what would have been there historically. Um, I wouldn't be doing justice to Devon in, uh, or where my, some of my background um, has been since the early 90s, really, <coughs> is around Colm grassland. Um, yeah, this is a, a really species-rich wet grass. <coughs> we find it in the northwest of the county, over the the, um, the shales and mudstones that, that, that are found there. Um, this is really poorly draining soil, heavy clays. You couple that with Atlantic winds and heavy rain, mild climate, and then add to the mix sort of piecemeal agriculture that's adapted over time. Um, and you get these stunning communities so that, that's full of meadow thistle uh, and yeah, the fen meadow is, is one of the special treats and you've got, on Dartmoor you do get that in, in some of the valley mire systems but to see that in a lowland habitat in England is, is a real treasure and we support the vast majority of the remaining, uh, of the remaining habitat in the country and uh, yeah, we uh, and places in South West Wales um, support the vast majority. There's a few glimpses in Brittany and over in Galicia in northern Spain, but this is uh, yeah, the majority of the world's resources tucked in, in North West Devon. Um, and all of all of those habitats I've talked about, I briefly touched on it earlier, and the diversity relate to the geology. Uh, I talked about Jurassic, Devonian, Cretaceous, Triassic, etc. Um, all of those reflected those eras in time, which give very different soil, um, very, sorry, very different geology, which gives rise to very different soils. Um, this is up in northwest Devon, at Hart on, uh, near Hartland Point. Um, it's a great place to go rock climbing, but they, they liken it to a loosely shuffled pack of cars, so it's, it's quite high risk. Um, but yeah. The, when, when you're there in those habitats, in those environments, you, you do see how much that environment shapes the grasslands that are on the top. And that's shaped by what's underneath it, the, our, our soils. And uh, they really are the foundation of your meadow. Uh, often, I think as ecologists, we, we focus on you know, what type of vegetation community is, and we talk in all of these funny codes like MG5, you might even MG5C even. Uh, but no, what, what you need to think about is the whole picture, what's going on under the ground and above the ground, and think about that holistically. Um, unfortunately, in Devon, some people don't, and we, we do see scenes like this. I mean, we do have these really friable soils, um, and in some conditions and some scenarios, uh, you have the wrong crop in at the wrong time of year and you are just washing away everything that your new grassland and the future food security um, of, the, of the country is based upon. Um, all that biodiversity on the surface as well. Um, so next few, few slides, I'm just going to talk about some of the changes really that the, the county has faced going back to probably around the 19, <coughs> 1950s. And um, it might sound slightly negative where I'm going, but I think we, we, you know, we look at scenes like this and uh, you know, we should be you know, 
quite a crowd of in the county where we do have these hedgerow networks. Um, this is over in the Black Downs. And, you know, that is all of the tissue which, which joins together all of these various different habitats, be they the hedgerows, the orchards, the woodlands, steep slope grasslands. But that really disguises a problem in that that is this green and pleasant land which really doesn't have very many species rich grasslands left. There are probably, I'll see if I can get my, that, there, there's probably a few species rich grasslands there, maybe something going on here and here. Generally though, that, those grasslands are managed pretty intensively um, and the big benefit is that they are still small field systems and they probably are in those areas, some of the seed bank that was there historically. Um, so these are figures you've probably heard before, but um, whether it's 97% or 98%, um, dancing on the head of a pin really, it's, uh, we, we've had you know, catastrophic losses of species rich grasslands over the last century or so. Um, and those sorts of figures, 98% decline, you hear the same when it comes to our populations of species which rely on those habitats and the, the invertebrates that they produce and provide. So great horseshoe bats, similar sort of figure in terms of their decline over the last 100 years, starting to bounce back, but they're bouncing back from, a, from an absolute low point. Um, and we should be talking about these things, so corn crakes. And corn crakes, I've, I've, I've shown a few people a book earlier. I've got a book here from 1839, uh, The Natural History of South Devon. Um, and it just refers to corn crakes as just being you know, common, basically. Um, when they arrive, when they go, uh, it's just a sort of throwaway comment, really. Um, so, you know, we, we, we've got to remember that we have lost a lot of our wildlife, and, and now we sort of refer to corn crakes as being a species which is only found up in uh, the Mackay grasslands of Scotland, uh, and we've forgotten that history of the fact that they were a common species in Devon. Um, and we should be, you know, this is about thinking big, we should be thinking about a time when species like that are back in our county. Um, and the big changes, in this, really, I, I, you often hear about what, what are the major changes to land management which have driven these, uh, these losses of species rich grassland. And this is the biggest shift, is from small scale uh, extensive farming practices to intensive silage. Uh, I mean, we're pr primarily a pastoral <coughs> county. We grow a lot of grass, we grow grass really well. Uh, and the shift from allowing things to set seed, um, to take a hay crop that's then turned, dry, seed, seed is set, to in some circumstances in northwest Devon now, we have zero graze uh, dairy farms uh, where we are, they're taking seven or eight cuts of silage a year. Uh, you know, it won't be long before we hear the forage harvesters taking silage, um, perhaps in, in early May. Uh, you know, in terms of how species and, and um, biodiverse habitats can, can, can cope with that, I mean, that, that's, that's very, very difficult. Invertebrates cannot survive in that sort of environment, but certainly above ground. Yeah, clearly we need to we need to produce food, but we need to get that balance right. And I'd argue, you know, taking seven cuts of silage a year is probably get the balance is somewhat wrong. Um, and we changed our, the cover of, on our land. So you know, we've incentivised cropping such as large areas of flax and linseed, especially in the 1980s when a lot of land went under the plough because of that incentivisation. Um, certainly not going to. Um, blanket all areas of maize with, with what, what I'm going to say now is, you know, maize is a really important crop, it's a great um, crop to conserve to keep cattle over the winter period. But we are seeing la large areas of land um, which are um, industrially farmed and just let, contract let, and the whole farm is going over maize, um, often for biodigesters, but uh, often for, for animal feed as well. And there's little room in those sorts of uh, farming systems for uh, you know, this range of plants and species that we're, we're so <coughs> interested in. So the, just after the, the Second World War, I think it was the American Air Force overflew uh, a lot of the county. And they provided this amazing record, sort of 70 years ago now, uh, of what habitats 
used to look like. And these can really help guide some of our um, interventions and, and you know, support that we're giving to farmers to, um, you know, to restore some of these really species rich grasslands. So this is Heartland Moor, I don't know if anyone knows, right up in northwest Devon. This is the line of the A39 now, um, which goes over the top of the moor. Fantastic views out to Lundy going in that way. But you can see, this is vast swathes of habitat. You can see all the runnels, you know, natural processes over most of this area. So I quickly drew, drew um, lines in terms of where, where was that habitat in those years. That's present day. <coughs> large areas of Sitka spruce being planted. You know, some very large dairy farms, um, which have uh, on short-term lay grasslands. So not much room for, for species-rich habitats there. Um, looking a bit more locally, 1947 assessment. This was carried out by Devon Biodiversity Record Centre, which did some fantastic uh, aerial photo analysis. So this is Chudley. So right in the centre here is our, one of our most important great horseshoe bathrooms in, uh, in the ca caves, which are in a out limestone and outcrop. Uh, yellow is urban area. Um, so you can see the large expansion of urban. Uh, but the pink is our probably species-rich grasslands. Um, and you can see quite a substantial decrease. See the in inclusion of the A38 coming up through. So you can see over time how, how habitats have, have changed. Um, but I talked about the connective tissue earlier between all of these areas, um, and that's so crucial. If we do have these small um, ha uh, areas of grassland which have been maintained and, and have been looked after, we need the connectivity in that landscape for species to move between them and for that exchange of all of that seed. Um, this is in Marlborough area down in South Devon, and you can see the quite dramatic shifts and changes, especially when you look at hedgerow trees, uh, the networks of trees in the landscape, you know, isolated hedgerows now. Um, so yeah, dramatic, dramatic changes. Um, and in terms of a picture painting a thousand words, this is Raffinford Moor. You drive through as you go up to northwest Devon. Um, fantastic, <coughs> stunning area of common grassland. And this is the North Devon Link Road, which cuts through it. Um, you know, obviously, a fabulous sign there, which just you know, shows how we're splitting up some of these really special sites. Um, when, I, when I started my work with Devon Wildlife Trust, I, I started a project with work, um, Working Wetlands, it's a project which is supported by Southwest Water. It's around um, through their upstream thinking program, which is focusing on actually, if we're ensuring water going into our reservoirs is cleaner, um, then that's going to reduce the costs um, for customers to actually clean that water <laughs> or the cost for the water company. Um, so, yeah, if we're able to change and support landowners in land management practices, producing cleaner water, um, and we get the knock-on benefits of more wildlife-rich habitat, then fantastic. Um, but this is one, one image that greeted me. This, this area here was once one large area of common grassland. Um, that went under the plough. Um, you've got this remnant of common here, so quite large areas were abandoned. Um, and then new plantation of Sitka spruce, which had gone on some quite species rich grassland next to it. And that sums up what I've really been say, saying over the last few minutes in terms of the sorts of pressures that. Our, our grasslands are facing. And abandonment, I think, is one of the crucial th uh, issues at the moment in that you know, the, these, these areas of habitat are, are a real challenge to manage. They're, they often cost money to manage. Um, there's often risks associated with how these areas are managed. You're always worried about whether, um, you know, doing exactly the right thing, whether there might be penalties from the Royal Payment Agency. So often landowners think, you know, I'll, I'll just close the gate. And with, uh, you know, changes around farm subsidy support that we will be seeing in a um, post-Brexit environment, I said the B word, um, you yeah, know, I think that is going to be a pressure that we will see ever more is in the, the, those areas of marginal habitat will be more than likely abandoned um, and we need to provide all the support we possibly can to be able to maintain those in, in fine condition. Um, but there's only a few more of these negative slides. Um, so 
Uh, we're, all these areas are facing threats in terms of pests, diseases. You know, we've just heard about uh, ash dieback for the last five years. Um, but Ptoniasa here, non-native invasives, which are getting out into to these habitats, which are pre you know, presenting a real challenge for people to manage them. So Tall Bay Coast and Countryside Service, who have got these stunning limestones, uh, steep cliff environments, and then Ptoniasa gets in. It's a, it's a tough one to try and get rid of. Um, in Bolson, we all know the, the changes that that is having on our riverside and riparian habitats, um, and clearly, you know, things, things are changing in terms of our environment, in terms of our, you know, our global weather patterns, um, and that's having an impact locally in terms of having more severe and erratic weather. Um, so, you know, we've talked about just the, the sheer scale of loss of these grassland habitats. Um, only 2% or so of UK's grasslands are species rich. The, those that remain are quite um, vulnerable to fragmentation um, and then just gradual decline, sort of death by a thousand cuts. There is protection for those sorts of habitats, um, but the protections are pretty poorly known. So there are the environmental impact of assessment regulations. Um, they apply to semi natural areas of habitat. But often, uh, you know, they, they are not <coughs> that. And we've got to do an awful lot more to, to share, you know, how special these habitats are. Um, give people the ability to, you know, to connect with those areas of habitat, to experience them. Um, but also, we need to do more in terms of how we're demonstrating their, their, their real values, you know, their monetary values as well. Uh, to some of the key decision makers so that these areas are more likely to be protected. Um, I talked earlier just about some of the species uh, which mirror declines, and this is one of my hobby horses, is that um, you know, we have uh, our species index at this point, um, 1976, probably about the time I was born, um, and see, see various declines, Ge generally, um, you know, on most species in the indices, there's a downward trend. But the big problem is, is that date. Is that we? I've just shown earlier. You know, there's there's a book here of 1839 that talks about sea eagles on Dartmoor, corn crakes, pine martins, stone martins, uh, nightingales. Just as a like, throwaway comment, uh, you know, we'd be we'd be flocking to these areas to try and find them. Um, so. Yeah, shifting baselines is a big issue that I don't want my children to grow up. We were born in the mid-2000s for that to be their baseline. Um, I want them to hopefully go back and think of baselines back into well before 1976. I've just referred to that. But yeah, Natural History of South Devon, it's a fascinating read um, and really inspiring because you can start thinking, gosh, you know, there were these things like breathing short ear owls on Dartmoor. As I said, seagulls that were flying around this area, um, and it's not so long ago. Um, but into solutions now. So, I think it was back to 2012 or so, Professor Sir John Lawton came uh, and a panel came up with these four words, uh, and they, they summarised everything that uh, the conservation movement really needs to focus on. You know, our sites need to be bigger. Uh, they need to be in better condition, there needs to be more of them, and we need to join them up. Uh, and came up with a. It's one of these things that was fantastic that finally someone was able to put on just a few pieces of paper what we stumbled around trying to describe what we were after. Um, so, having core zones where wildlife is really plentiful, um, you know, bursting from the seams basically out into that wider landscape that there's areas which we're restoring and helping to recreate, uh, that they're really well connected up, having stepping stones and corridors between them, and surrounding that are sustainable land use areas. But I do have one criticism with this, I dare to have a criticism of Professor Sir John Lawson. Um, this clips the sustainable land use area, so that implies that there's something that isn't sustainable land use. But uh, yeah, there's a bit of an anathema. But uh, anyway, I think, I think that must have been the, uh, the publicist that made a bit of an error. Um, so if we're thinking in terms of our, our grassland habitats, we, we've lost about 98%. Um, so we need to create more, obviously it's this, this easy. Um, create new core areas, 
um, starting to think about where, where they are, joining them up, um, and, and connecting the habitats up. In reality, this is a, this is a site called Meshaw Moor up in northwest Devon. Um, it's one of our nature reserves. Uh, that's the boundary of the reserve. Um, so bigger, and join it up to other land around. We've worked with neighbouring farmers to bring those habitats into to top notch condition. Um, and then thinking about, well, how do you start reconnecting them up in that wider landscape? Um, so there's a great dairy farmer that has got that land in between, managing that land really sustainably. Um, and we've even gone into what you can see back there is a very large Sitka spruce plantation, which is now no more. It's all been harvested, the timber's been used, and that's, that was an area that was planted on uh, historically very wildlife rich common grassland habitat. So you can start making this scale of, uh, of change. Um, and I'm going to just take us off on a slight tangent. This is another piece of work that uh, Sir John Norton did in a presentation he gave to the Devon Local Nature Partnership uh, back in 2015. Um, <coughs> Up on this axis here, uh, the Y axis, I think that's one, yes, um, is management intensity uh, and on other area of site in square kilometres, but that's on a log scale. Um, so the vast majority of UK conservation, our nature reserves, are right up here, and we expend you know, a lot of energy and a lot of resource in, in keeping those core areas in as good condition as possible. But the future really is about making sure they're as, as large as they possibly can. So, you know, the amount of effort that we're putting in per unit area starts to, starts to drop. So, you know, we, we really need to push down to, to think about, you know, our nets and our Ennerdales, uh, sites where there's much more natural processes occurring, but not forgetting that actually at the core of those are really wildlife rich spaces which we need to be maintained and supported until potentially you can get up to a certain scale uh, where you can relax some of the management and allow natural processes to, to take a bit more of a rule and a bit more of a lead. Um, so that's the sort of principles around rewilding. Um, but yeah, how far down that, that sorry, my pen's not working, how far down that axis you go just depends on what area you're in and obviously all the cultural <coughs> heritage that's around in those areas. Um, and getting that balance right is, is a challenge, but I think in some areas, um, you know, thinking about much larger sites where na nature is in much more of a, in control is something that we need to think about and consider. So back to the molehills. So, you know, as I said, think big, you know, start by starting small. And yeah, it really is about thinking about how can we yeah, and perhaps actual garden, I know it's my, my garden looks a little bit like that. Uh, yeah, get seed to be able to reseed those areas of perfect um, yeah, soil um, and start connecting those areas up. Start joining the dots, see what works on your particular patch, uh, what species do really well, um, what don't, what you're struggling with, um, and then build up from there. Um, so in the process of thinking about going from a you know, grand idea and I think some people think, right, yeah, what's the what's the first step? And my advice is you know, be really nosy. Have a look what's happening in your area. Think about uh, the verges. Just walk around and keep your eyes open and just think about the landscape in a slightly different way than perhaps if you're out just walking the walking the dog. Um, you know, what sort of species really thrive? Look at look especially in the hedgebacks and the verges and they will give you a really good indication of what's going to do well on, on your land. Um, lots of people have really good data. Uh, Devon Biodiversity Record Centre has got excellent data for, for large areas of the county in terms of the sorts of habitats that are there. They, they were involved, this is up in North Devon again, doing what we call parish biodiversity audits. So every single field was uh, looked at from aerial photos and ground truth. Uh, to help make sense of this, the, the red is improved grassland, the green is unimproved and more species-rich grassland. But when you, when you see the landscape in that way, you just start thinking, of what areas would potentially be best, if you've got choice, of where you can restore or start to recreate habitat. Um, the next thing I would say, especially if you're looking at, at scale, is, 
is get advice, you know, talk, you've got this great community, um, and I think that's part of the benefits of seeing and learning from others in terms of what's worked and what hasn't. Um, but also, if you're thinking, well, potentially, there are large or field scale works that could happen, um, then there could be sources of funding, there could be agri-environment schemes to look at, um, and there are people that can help and provide support and advice. Um, anyone likes Harry Potter? No. <laughs> that in the process at this stage, gather, as I say, gather information, be nosy, um, but don't get carried away too quickly. Um, do check, do think about, you know, is there anything that could go wrong? Um, am I on really friable soil, steep slopes? Um, you know, is there a historic environment, for example, in the, in the area that you might have to take account of? Is there perhaps a scheme or a, a your basic payment scheme or what have you that um, you may fall foul of? So take care. Um, think about what could, you know what the ground conditions are like, what the challenges are going to be. Um, again, typical North Devon, if you're under, or, or even you know, large parts of Dartmoor. Um, I know it sounds a little bit like brandy sucking eggs, but uh, yeah. We really do think what can the site conditions are like and what hurdles you're going to have to get over. Um, even down to can the site be accessed? You know, is the sort of machinery, the types of things that you're looking at possible and viable? Have you got access to, to um, you know, machinery and four-legged things that can, can help you achieve what you're trying to, to, uh, to deliver? Um, and again, one thing is, is, is step back and, and it's one of the first things that we do when we take on new land is just um, watch, see what happens, let it grow, see what species are in there. If you've had years of agricultural management, um, which has been relatively intensive, often there are, there's quite a good seed bank there. And actually just throttling back slightly and seeing what plants grow you'll be amazed uh, what species might be uh, already there and in the sward that have just been cut or grazed <coughs> previously. Um, and absolutely, the, the fundamental thing that I talked about earlier is around soil and soil health, but also soil condition. Um, you know, do take soil samples, dig, dig a soil pit, see what the, your soil's like. You know, is it really heavy clay or is it a silt? Uh, you know, is it free draining or, or not, or is it relatively, relatively waterlogged? Think about the nutrient levels in those, those soils as well. Um, it might, might be so nutrient rich that you'll, you'll struggle to get that wildflower diversity in your grasslands. Um, crucially, then, think about, think about seed. You know, where's your seed supply um, coming from? So it, it may be that it is a, your, your packet of seed um, that you get from, from the local uh, garden centre, and you know, that's fantastic. But if you're thinking at field scale, uh, if you're purchasing a bespoke seed mix, that can be really, really quite expensive. So something we look at is around seed harvesting. So we've harvested very large areas with brush, brush harvesters. Um, it's a really cost-effective way of getting a large amount of seed that we can then use on private land um, to help landowners to reseed vast areas. But it is quite labour intensive. And one of the tricks is making sure that you're harvesting seed at different times of the year. Because obviously when you go in for a seed with your seed har harvester, you're only harvesting the seed which is viable at that time. Um, so doing it at different times of the year is, is really important. You've then got to rid of the seed, get rid of uh, any of that chaff, any of the grass that you've managed to collect on the way, uh, sift it, sieve it, clean it, dry it before you bag the seed up and <coughs> ready to be transported. Um, I think last year we, we managed about two, thir two thirds of a tonne of wildflower seed that was collected, ready to be seeded on, on land. One of the crucial things though, and I said watch out earlier, is that in doing so, you need to be registered um, as a seed supplier if you're going to be harvesting seed and putting it on other, other land, especially at this sort of scale. So we register with the, the um, Animal and Plant Health Agency so that we can do this sort of work. Um, one really effective technique is, is green hay. 
Um, that's harvesting that hay when it's green with all of the seed that's contained in there. But it requires quite a military operation. Um, when hay is cut, it heats up very, very quickly, especially when it's baled. So you can only probably bale it for one or two hours before you have to get it from your donor site to your receptor site and for that to be spread out. Um, you can do it with fantastic volunteer support like we're doing here down in the Avon Valley. Um, but you can do it at the big scale as well. And we've dealt with sort of 40 or 50 large round bales. Um, but it requires everything, all planets to align in one, in one day where you're cutting, baling, shifting it onto the new site. The site has to be really well prepared to be able to take that seed um, and then be able to distribute it. So we use a silage chopper. So these are our tractors um, out at work doing some fan fantastic uh, sowing. Site preparation is, is absolutely critical. Often when, when I've seen even quite small scale work, uh, the amount of scarification of the soil has been quite limited and you know, that just gives the grasses a chance to bully out all of those quite weedy wild flowers that are trying to germinate. And you know, th those grasses are big thugs and they're, they're there to bully, bully these smaller grass, yeah, the wild flowers. And uh, you, know, you can help that by <coughs> breaking that sward up as, as much as you can. And generally around 50% is about right. So we take off, and when we're dealing with large scale work, we've got a uh, cutter and baler, so that's there on the left. So we remove all of the vegetation we possibly can. We use a springtime harrow there on the bottom right um, to open the sward up a bit, put the seed on, and then use cows to trample back, back in. Um, there are, I, I could spend an awful long time talking about all of the challenges that we've had after we've sown some of these grasslands. And you, you learn after a while you know, the sorts of things which can take over and can outcompete some of the things that you're trying to achieve. Um, the two on the left are the ones to really worry about creeping thistle and, and ragwort um, because you have a, a, you know, there's regulations, there's responsibilities to make sure that those species aren't causing problems across your neighbours. Um, so yeah, they are things to, to take into account and to watch out for. But there on the right, the t some of my uh, bet noirs really are creeping buttercup and Yorkshire fog. Uh, and they, they are real thugs. And when, when they're in the grasslands in high densities, they really can push out some of the things that you're trying to, to regenerate. Sowing is, is, it can be quite an art form. We've got uh, the sower there, broadcast sower that sits on the back of the quad and we can mix the seed with kiln dried sand and get that distributed over large areas. And actually baskets and buckets, kiln dried sand mixed with the seed and actually broadcasting that with people is, is pretty effective as well. And as I said earlier, one of the other things is making sure that seed's got contact with the soil. So we either use cows that can actually trample that seed in um, or you roll, roll the surface to get that seed well connected. Um, often, although um, yeah, it it's quite, can be quite costly, but some of the green hay sowing or seed harvesting, you can miss certain species. Um, so looking at plugs and plug planting can be a way of making sure that those, those seeds are back into the, the, the soil and the soil. Not this chap, but nature's little helper. Um, I think you've you probably all heard about the yellow rattle. The yellow rattle is a, is a par semi parasitic plant, um, likes to attack some of the big bullies, some of these gra heavier, more um, vigorous grasses, and can reduce their dominance. And that just gives that space for other plants to be able to get a little bit of a foothold and works really effectively. Um, can sometimes dominate, but it goes in cycles. People often notice it goes in maybe a five or a six year cycle, sometimes dominating in some sort of waxing and waning. But if it does dominate too much, um, we want to control it. It just, it, because it's an annual, it um, is easy to top and to uh, get on top of, but it really does reduce the real vigor of quite a lot of grasses. And aftercare. So you've, you've got this fantastic uh, seed that you've purchased. 
or you, all this work that you've done, <laughs> cleaning seed, uh, and you put it out over your newly sown area and these things get to work. Do, do take it into account, think what sort of numbers of slugs that you have in an area. If you've got really um, an old, uh, older sward, lots of nooks and crannies and perhaps thatch in there, you're likely to have quite a lot of slugs and they do love eating a lot of these young shoots, especially the sort of clover, um, you know, birds of trefoil family. Um, we have used some organic slug treatments, iron phosphate, um, which is quite effective, but it's one thing, it's whether, whether you want to go down that route, but it's certainly one that you should take into account, because sometimes these slugs can, uh, can do quite a lot of damage. Um, I'm just going to go through now just a few of the projects that we've um, been involved with, some of the successes, some of the challenges. Uh, I'll go through them rel relatively, a um, bit of a whistle-stop tour really, um, but some of the things that we're really proud of that we've been able to deliver. So the, these are a list of uh, the projects, the Devon Great Horseshoe Bat project that we lead on behalf of a large partnership, Exeter Wild City, which is an uh, urban-based project about really making uh, the city of Exeter as wildlife rich as it possibly can and giving people connection with nature in that, in that area. Um, the Avon Valley project, you know, some of you have heard around, very much community based around the landowners that own some of the steeper grasslands, um, some of the more wildlife rich grasslands that are in the Avon Valley, um, sharing skills, ideas and uh, supporting each other in, in grassland restoration. Um, and then the two other very larger projects are working weapons that I referred to earlier up in northwest Devon and the Northern Devon Nature Improvement Area, which is focusing on catchment scale conservation work up in the river storage. Um, but let's start with, with Exeter Wild City. <coughs> so this was an unloved pack of, uh, of an area of office car park. They decided that under the tree, it was probably a bit too dangerous to have the car park. It was a bit Monterey Pine that kept shedding its limbs, so it wasn't a good place to park. And we got involved with the office team and put some cornflower annuals in and produced a, you know, a really fantastic display. So just at the small sort of five meter by five meters, you can bring that sort of diversity into you know, people's daily lives. Um, also been in some of the parks and rally parks in Exeter. We've been involved with a whole range of different school groups who've started to look after their patch, and whether that's a few square metres, whether that's alongside a um, you know, verge or on their walk to school, it doesn't matter. What it's about is you know, getting them in contact with nature and um, you know, bringing that sort of wildlife diversity into their lives. So we get them involved doing all the hard work in the raking and removal of vegetation, scarifying the soil, which are doing a fantastic job. Uh, communities involved in sowing the seed itself, and then acting like cattle or rollers. Uh, yeah. So they're, they're treading in all of the seed. There's a conger up there on the top right. Um, I'm not sure the parents were particularly chuffed with us that day, but they got a bit over and enthusiastic and started rolling around. Uh, but yeah, it's great. That's what kids should be involved in. And the, the results are absolutely tremendous. So some of these are annuals, some of them are perennials, some are even non-natives. Uh, you know, this is Prince of Wales Road in Exeter, where we wanted to show and give as big a display as we possibly can. And in an urban environment, we felt that was fine to include just one or two non-native species, just to prolong that flowering season and give people that sort of scene on their way to work or their walk to work. Uh, really, yeah, something I'm really, really pleased with and proud of the sort of outcomes that have been achieved through community and school, school effort. I'm just going to go through a few um, examples of what we've done uh, then up in Northwest Devon. This is an area around Dunstan Farm, so right up uh, just north of Holsworthy. So this is Dunstan, uh, which is a national nature reserve, a fantastic wet grassland um, full of uh, various different species, lesser butterfly orchid for example. Um, so the areas in blue are, are sites of special scientific interest and in pink are the areas of other, other areas of common grassland which are designated. Um, there are much artillery populations. So this is a real hotspot for the, for the species. And we recognise that, yeah, that a lot of these sites are quite vulnerable, they're quite fragmented, quite difficult to manage. So how can we start firstly getting these in good condition as possible, but then start joining the dots? So one thing we did was 
to actually use support from um, various funders to purchase new land. So this is Dunstan here, that's my artillery population. Two fields next door, which um, have the potential to be, uh, to be restored and recreated. So that's green hay sowing on a, on a grand scale. So about 50 uh, bales of soft brush were removed from the land. It was then scarified like this with a springtime current. Um, and then we worked with this tremendous chap, a you know, chap called Cyril Cole, a real in inspiration, who's uh, managed to sow I think, 30 or 40 round bales over the whole of this area. Uh, the results in the following year were tremendous. Already, you know, real, real diversity of species coming back. Um, in a very few locations, we do, in, in the most strategically important, so when you're connecting two areas of uh, very high value wildlife site, um, we do think about how to recreate habitat. And sometimes that's the more intensive end of the spectrum of, of habitat management. Um, in one case, we've actually ploughed, uh, we've planted uh, winter wheat, um, we've included a whole range of cornflower annuals in there, um, and we've fed the, those plants with a, a, quite a lot of nitrogen. And the purpose of that is keeping them as, as um, healthy as possible, but quite diminished in the amount of phosphates. So they're pulling the phosphates out of these really heavy clay soils. And phosphates are one of the major limiting factors. Um, and one of the, the nutrients that really hangs around in the soil. Um, so that has actually been quite an effective technique in being able to, uh, to strip out some of the nutrients in the soil. And here's one of the much more intensive ways of considering doing that. And, I would say, I must say before we go any further, this is in the most heavily targeted areas. You know, this is not something to think about over large areas of landscape. But where you have very nutrient rich topsoils, there is the potential to bury those. And you can flip things upside down. So here we're using a single furrow plant, it's about 60 centimetres deep, and it's flipping that soil horizon upside down. Uh, creating conditions, as you can see here, actually quite heavy clays which come back up to the surface uh, and then we put new seed over the top of that. Um, this is one, again, literally between two parts of a special area of conservation. So the highest designation that we have in the country, most important area of site, and we have one very intensive arable field that was between the two um, that had been managed in that way for some years. So we decided with the landowner support, that's the, the farm in the background there, to actually remove those soils. So we took out the, the top 10 centimetre horizon, used that for replacing, um, recreating the hedge banks back to 1800s um, hedgerow boundaries and reseeding the soil underneath. And that's, that's what it looked like in its first year. Um, and actually in this case, because this was being watched really closely, we slightly increased the amount of oxide daisies in the mix. So people were going past no, fabulous. It was not the most natural scene for that area. Oxide daisies aren't that well, um, well represented in that area, but it showed you that you know, people go, oh gosh, I can remember when fields were like that. And uh, you know, that got a lot of community and public support that were certainly looking over the hedge and questioning what we were doing. Um, one thing, so sort of getting into the technical detail a little bit, but sometimes when you have uh, these bare soils, there's, this, there's a real drive to try and get your wildflowers in there and get them to restore as quickly as they possibly can. Um, and often you'll find that the grasses just actually dominate and those, those, as I said, those slightly more weak wildflowers struggle. One of the things to do there is to get a grass sward, we call it a nurse sward, established. Get that steady, get the sward completely covered in, in grass, and then in a later date, maybe a year or two years down the line, chop into that and actually add new wildflower and wildflower seed, and that's much more, can be much more successful. Um, I talked earlier, this is actually a map of uh, the area that, or, sorry, photo of the area I referred to earlier. Um, where we looked at the 1947 aerial photos. We've seen the current land use, which is Sitka spruce. Um, previously was um, really species-rich grassland. 
and worked with landowners to um, remove, to harvest that timber. You know, that's going in, into the building industry. And then using very heavy machinery like this, this is a tungsten bladed mulcher on a bulldozer, basically, that goes over and removes all of the stumps over that whole area. So mulches all of those stumps down, creates the perfect conditions for that to regenerate. We don't reseed it at all in these circumstances. The seed bank is just there waiting to, to regenerate, and it regenerates really, really quickly. The trick then is to make sure cattle are moving through from that field into other fields, bringing seed, exchanging seed, and bringing some of the things in which might be missing from that seed bank. <coughs> it's been tremendously successful. Um, elsewhere, we try and solve some of the problems about future sustainability. So you, in, in these circumstances, you say, fantastic, we're, we're successful. We've given the farmer 25 more hectares of species-rich grassland. Right. I, now is the time you know, they've got to consider how these areas get managed, and often that means specialist machinery. Um, and this might, might be something that the, the partnership, the More Meadows partnership, considers in terms of what sort of machinery and a machinery ring, ring might actually work. We, we purchased a, a low ground pressure Alpine tractor, um, and that's been a huge benefit in getting around supporting landowners managing scrub doing some of the seed harvesting work and um, seed sowing um, and a great, great little bit of kit. And um, we, we did originally have that on just loan to landowners. Um, we now use, a, use it with an operator. Uh, but it's, that, that helps solve some of the problems. Um, we've also, uh, in the past, had a flying herd of cattle. So some of these areas, uh, which has been a real challenge to manage. Um, we want to get grazing animals on there, aftermath grazing after these areas have been brought back into hay meadow. We bought this herd of white parks that are now owned by the, the farmers in that area who use them to, to manage their grasslands. Um, so this just gives you an idea of the sort of scale of the advisory work that we've done up in North West Devon. So this sort of pinky colour are all the farms that we've, we've helped support and advise. Um, so yeah, a really substantial hectare, it's 33,000 hectares that we've advised since 2008. Um, about 5,000 hectares of common grassland has been um, restored or recreated. So yeah, a really tremendous figure. It's probably half, the equivalent of about half the urban area of Exeter. Um, and we're doing great work as well with the Great Horseshoe Bank project. These are the 11 maternity roosts in Devon, 11 key maternity roosts. Um, and the bats forage in about, yeah, focus their foraging around where these maternity roosts are. So providing these species-rich grassland habitats, which provide a huge amount of food for the bats, is one of the key things the project's involved in. So they've done a, a lot of great work, and I think work with the more meadows quite, quite a lot. Um, I'll briefly touch on the Avon Valley because I think this, this is more, more similar to the approach. You know, the projects I was referring to previously are really heavily reliant on large agri environment schemes, quite considerable capital funding, um, and you know, they, are, they are large scale projects over large areas. Um, but there, there is a really important role in you know, landscapes like the Avon Valley where you've got a limited number of quite steep, slow grasslands um, where you, you're making connections between landowners, uh, sharing ideas, skill support um, to, to start you know, increasing the amount of uh, wildflowers that there are. So about 150 landowners have been involved in that area and um, yeah, about 30 hectares of, of meadows are in that transition that are going from it was probably quite species poor um, when new seed has been um, introduced to start reinvigorating those areas. Um, so that, you know, they, they do some fantastic work, and as I said, it's heavily reliant on a lot of volunteer support um, and share, as I say, sharing of uh, time and effort between the, all the various landowners which are in that area. Um, and some of the results have been have been absolutely fantastic. Um, Donna said earlier I was going to talk about monitoring, but I'm not going to for very, for very long. Um, there's, there's a question, you know, for what makes a meadow? When, when have you been successful? Um, at what stage do you say, oh yeah, that, that feels good? Uh, that's, that's 
you know, that met my expectations. And there, there is an ecological or an, an ecologist answer sometimes. You know, we, as I talked earlier, we, we might talk in these various different codes about the different range of habitats or species that you might have or vegetation communities on your land. But really, you know, it's about when you go into the, these areas that you've, that you've helped restore, you know when those areas are really thriving. You, know, you go into an area which is really buzzing with insects. During the end of the season, or you know, September time, you'll see uh, spiders webs draped over most, most of the plants. Um, there may be one or two indicator species that you think, you know what, I would really like to see um, know, whatever it might be, great green bush trees or, or you know, baby skylark or something like that that's actually using that habitat. Um, and you know, think about what, what those indicators might be and, and you know, keep an eye out for them. But really it's about just that real, you'll know that when you'll have that real buzz around the land and that sheer diversity and uh, insects and, and different flowering plants that will, that will be on show. Um, if you get to a state where there's just one or two real bullies in there, like, like Yorkshire folk, perennial ryegrass and so on, then um, it's time to think about you know, perhaps taking other interventions. Um, but another thing, I briefly, uh, but I've chatted to I think, various members here before around, you know, you will be uh, and, and, having huge, and already have huge successes um, and sharing that information and making sure other people are aware of it is really crucial. Uh, you know, it's really important and well, one organisation here at the Denver Biodiversity Record Centre holds all the information around what we refer to as county wildlife sites. So these sites which aren't statutorily protected but are recognised in planning and planning law and agri-environment schemes for the, for the diversity and importance there are, are for wildlife. Um, and you know, I think having a band of a team of people that are able to get out, able to look at these grasslands and give that information to Devon Biodiversity Record Centre so that they're able to understand and uh, and to uh, you know to record that information, hold it there in prosperity, and be able to share that with others. I think is 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 really important. Um, so just in summary, um, created since 2008, about 370 hectares of, of really species-rich grassland on 136 landowners' land site on 129 sites. We've got 34 donor sites which are registered now with AFA, so that's the Animal Plant Health Agency, who are then able to, we're able to harvest that and then distribute that seed amongst the receptor areas where we're actually sowing it. Um, and as I said, about two thirds of a ton of uh, seed we harvested last year. Um, and that does have a value, you know, uh, and for landowners that potentially could be, be something, a new, potential new income streams uh, to help <coughs> sow the seed in other areas of land. Just, just briefly, I, 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 at the start I referred to understanding uh, the the values of these areas of, of habitat, um, you know, in terms of the, the sorts of uh, benefits to society that these areas provide us with. We've worked really closely with uh, the University of Exeter, comparing areas of common grassland with intensively managed grassland and looking at the different products that come from those areas of land or the sorts of services that they provide us with. Um, just quickly, th these are some of the experimental designs. So this is Mesh or Moore. We had plots in intensively managed grassland right next to areas which were in common grassland. And we wanted to look at the different um, hydrological characteristics, but also the water quality that was coming off those areas of, of grassland. Um, so water stored, this is litres, should be litres per metre cubed, I'm sure. Um, but here's our intensively managed grassland. Obviously, quite a limited amount of water that that's actually storing compared to the majority of these other coal or woodland habitats. You do see that actually coal is, is one of the habitats that um, stores more water than e even some sort of woodland communities. And I'm going to make sense of this. It looks exceptionally complicated. Um, this is ground level, okay? Rainfalls coming down. These are rainfall bars, so precipitation. Uh, this line at the top is uh, 
the water level that is recorded in cold grassland, and this is the water level in intensively managed grassland. So firstly, you can see, obviously, Colm is high, holding a higher water table. But what's really important is how it holds on to that water. So firstly, it holds water above ground level, and that's because it's a really tussocky habitat. It's got all of that texture, and it's, uh, it's a lot of roughness that stops the water just sort of pouring away. But these tails are really important. So after a rainfall event, uh, your intensively managed grass and sheds the water really quickly whereas you get a much slower re um, release of water from the areas of Colm. And that's obviously you know, really crucial from the flood risk and flood risk management perspective. But the water that comes off those habitats is, is much cleaner. So these are pollutant levels, so mean, medium pollutant levels. So phosphorus, you've got Colm bar on the blue, and the red is from a typical agricultural catchment. <coughs> it's intensively managed. <coughs> so phosphorus, <coughs> sort of two thirds, suspended sediment, about a third, um, and total organic nitrogen, much lower. Um, and then maximum pollutant levels. So this is maximum phosphorus down here on the bottom left. So you can see this really important role that wildlife rich grasslands can play in terms of the production of and um, supply of clean water. Um, and that reduces your costs as customers for Southwest Water when um, you know, there, there were lower costs in terms of cleanup. And I'll just finish on this, this slide. That, um, you know, if, I, if I was a child um, back and seeing those habitats, I'd be tucked in the ditch up here somewhere. Um, you know, we want, uh, and this is a great uh, David Attenborough quote, right, which is saying, no, no one will protect what they don't care about. No one will care about what they've never experienced. And I want to make sure that you know, all children have got the, the ability to experience something that is much more diverse and much more inspiring than, than, that, um, than that scene, and to get them out and to experience what, what really, truly wildlife-rich habitats can offer. Um, and finally, finally. Then there's one meadow that I haven't talked about, and uh, even know some of the sort of background and history of, of Devon Wildlife Trust over the last five years, I don't know where this is going. Um, but there, there's one meadow, and it's called a beaver meadow. Uh, so, be beavers have the capacity, obviously, to raise water tables, they dam areas of habitat, they, they um, remove scrub, they coppice trees, and they, they create these really dynamic wetland environments. And uh, by creating these areas of wetland, and then as some of those other waters drain away, you get the, what they call beaver meadows. So these are areas that the beavers clear, they eat the tall herb fen sort of communities which are there, and they create this huge diversity of life. Uh, and these are meadows that I hope we see for many years to come. Um, it's our final year of the, the River Otter Beaver Trial. Um, we'll be giving evidence to DEFRA uh, at the end of this year, and we hope that the, uh, these creatures will be Yeah, if you want to, if you've got 
a mission, say, but yeah. you, you want to forage and find seed that's in your area um, and to be able to sow that into your, that particular patch, then that's a... That's but a I have to sow, right? I can't just broadcast it. No, if you're broadcasting into a really, into an established grassland sward, it will really struggle. You right. might get one or two that germinate. But on the on average rule is, I would really rake that grassland heavily back, prepare it with about probably 50% of bare earth, um, which is a really high percentage, yeah. um, and then sow the grass, the, the seed, sorry, grass, the flower seed into that, and then roll it, roll it in, okay. you know, step it in, and that will be really, really successful. But one of the best tips in there, if you can, is find um, yellow apple seed, and that will help just reduce the dominance of some of the grasses yellow that you've got. Yeah. Okay. You've been used to that in autumn. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Yeah, I, I should add that. <laughs> yeah, yellow rattle needs a period of fertilisation, so it needs to be, have a few frosts. So it has to go in in autumn and not go in as a spring zone. Can I just uh, say that Goran Farm is a wonderful source of yellow apple seeds. Yes. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
before a plow scenario, we have sprayed off um, yeah, an entire an entire field. Um, but that's that's in very very localised circumstances, and um, yeah, he was very careful. I, I wouldn't. Yeah, I think pack spraying like that, you, you're better bit of elbow grease really and um, you know and, and scarifying that soil. I think if the grasses are that vigorous you're considering the sort of herbicide but then it's more thinking about what it, it is has that land got the capacity to um, to have that sort of grassland diversity and perhaps things somewhere else. Mm. Is there any way of getting rid of rushes like bull rushes? Uh, well, so the, the, the things you tend to get in grasslands are sort of um, soft rush or hard rush. Um, and th what they like is basically quite a waterlogged band. Um, so, you know, drainage is one thing that can, can help, which generally isn't, isn't, you know, isn't something that we would be recommending. Um, they also like it to be quite acidic, so lining an area equally probably not something you really want to be considering. Um, topping is is pretty effective, but often people just top um, too infrequently. So if you top areas of rushes perhaps three times in a year, you can start really knocking their vigour back, and that will make room for some of the wild flowers that are in there. What I would say is getting that balance right, because having you know, a proportion of rushes in your field and amongst the grass, you know, wildflowers is, is fantastic. In some circumstances, I've seen fields where it's just wall to wall soft rush, um, and there you do really want to cut, bale, remove, and, um, and start reducing their vigour a little bit. But some people have effectively used to be wiping, um, but again, you know, use of chemicals in that way, you, you, you have to have a very, well, firstly, a, a site that you're not having any sort of collateral damage, should we say. So that's really top notch um, piece of equipment and someone who really knows how to use it um, because often we've seen some, some disasters when it comes to weed wipers that are not been working. Mm -hmm. just, just to help that uh, lady, um, I've found that on, on our farm that if you set the flail on her, um, loads, uh, low and go very slowly, mm -hmm. so it's actually cutting into the um, reed tussocks. Yep. Um, that does have a tremendous effect. I mean, mm. within a couple of years, it will all gone. Yeah, I mean, that, that's good. But then, um, it's, again, it's getting that balance right. So, it, generally, we would be talking around not doing the entire area in, in one go. So, generally, sort of 30, 40 percent, knocking those back really heavily. Um, because yeah, you, the, the invertible life that's there can be knocked back quite, quite a lot. But you know, a field of soft brush is, is not the best thing for, for biodiversity. Can I ask a question? Um, you had a, you had a slide, but you, you you said something about the about the management of, of sites. Mm. And having just read the Wilding book about NEF, yes. one of the things that happened there was that because they didn't money, I think the southern block, they didn't do any management. Really. They just let it scrub up. And, yeah, yeah. And they had a fantastic biodiversity to come back. So where do you sort of draw the line between management and not management? Um, it's, yeah, it's inter interesting. Getting getting that balance right is, mm. is a challenge. I, I think what you've got to look at is well, what what for an, for an net circumstance where they they throttle right back in terms of management intensity. What's in the seed bank? What's ready to go? What's what's mm. there that can help recolonise? And they had some areas where that, that seed bank is obviously really really ready to go. Um, they also had because they were using um, pigs and cattle. They had that disturbance in there, which is mm -hmm. so important. So, although it is, you know, it's a wild site, they still got produce coming from. They still got that livestock, mm -hmm. and they still got that, that management, which is occurring, albeit in, in a much more naturalistic way. Um, what what you don't want in in terms of the that sort of wilding element is can would we want to see you know these really treasured small areas of, of really species rich grassland? Um, eventually scrub up mm -hmm. um, yeah, at the small scale that will happen. Mm -hmm. If you were looking at, at the 1000 hectare scale, you've got the ability to connect all of those areas up, have that management, that dynamism which mm -hmm. constantly maintains those areas of habitat 
but they won't be in one place. They'll be shifting around over time. Um, so it's getting that right. I think you know, just, just throttling back on management at a very small scale, you'll get a change in biodiversity and potentially a loss of some of the really, really exciting things which are there. So think at scale. I mean, we have <coughs> these core areas which are nature reserves within perhaps a landscape of 500, 1,000 hectares. And the success is at the point when you can say, uh, we, we don't have to manage that site as intensive before because we can see these patchworks and networks of, of habitat you know, joining up, yeah. Um, yeah, perhaps scrubbing up, but as others are cleared. So so that's what it's more, it's more and more. And what was the first slide you had? Uh, bigger, better, more. Bigger, more. better, more. Yeah, yeah. 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 Any more questions? I was asked about all the bug species mm. that we talked about. Uh, there's a long list of them. Yeah, if you're not using glyphosate, how are you managing it's just taking real care of the star and not allowing them to get hold. So um, we, on some of the sites where we were supporting landowners in the photographs we gave, we, we were we we had a lot of volunteer support and staff support to to be monitoring, watching those sites from the earlier stages and getting on top of any of those sorts of issues. What am I thinking about? Yeah, digging, pulling. Um, yeah, and if you're in there as early as possible, that's relatively easy. But that it's crucial. As soon as you see a problem, it's almost too late. Mm -hmm. yeah, as soon as it's really visible, so you need to be thinking about look, you know, those bathing leaves, identifying them, and, and getting on top of them. So when you are breaking a soil, you know, the, the soil and the way that we have, that's when the risks are at their greatest. But you need to invest to make sure that it doesn't go the wrong way. Um, so, zero tolerance then for marsh thistle. Not marsh thistle, no, I mean, creeping thistle, no, marsh thistle. I mean, we, in our field, we've got, I chopped out every creeping thistle in our field, and we had the most fantastic stand the next year. Yep. And, and it, it was full of beetles and butterflies yeah. and violet, and it smelled yeah. amazing. And I spent ages in there building. Yeah, photograph. Mm. No, absolutely. No, I'm, I'm a great fan. <laughs> of what the, the area I'm talking about here is that those early stages, of, mm -hmm. especially when you've broken a sward up, you can go from I mean, your scenario where you've got this nice massive <coughs> area and it's, it's fan, fabulous, especially for a lot of pollinators. Yeah. We don't want to you know, destroy that sort of environment. But when you've got five hectare field, and it's it's a bare earth, right. and there's potentially suddenly weed flood, and you would have to start again. You know, that that's where we've got that real zero tolerance. When you know the sward covers over and it's started to settle down, then yeah, if you've got small patches of this mm -hmm. and so on. Fantastic, that's great. Okay, oh, this is just in those early phases. Yeah. Any more? Any more? Oh, that's wonderful. After you have recreated. Meadow area. How long does it take to, as you put it, settle down? Uh, and to what extent, 10, 20 years later, does it actually look like what you expected it to look like? Gosh, how long does it take to settle down? Yeah. <laughs> they are both extremely good questions. I mean, obviously, it depends on the site. But when, when you do start, um, especially on the more intensive side where you're, where you're um, breaking the sward up, you do get a bit of. Uh, of release of nutrients and so you do get a bit of flux at the start and some bullies get in but eventually they can be they can be out competing. I think yeah you, you should be looking at sort of between four and five years when it starts to really settle down and you, you start to understand you know what species have colonized and it gets gets on the on sort of more level playing field. In those early days you can get quite big shifts in terms of the sorts of species and how they colonize. Um, yeah, three, three to five years and things settle down. Um, but then, yeah, what trajectory are they on? Where are they, where are they going? And I think that's down to the, the sort of management approaches that you take. Mm. So depending on what you do, whether you are, uh, you know, taking a hay crop at a particular time of year, whether or not you, you know, are you aftermath graze it, all those sorts of things, whether it's a hot year or a dry, you know, dry year, or wet year, will determine you know, those sort of long-term fluctuations over sites. So, um, yeah, I think it should be exciting to see something in a constant state of flux rather than, yeah, rather than two step. Mm -hmm. So one more question. Have you 
experience in terms of managing a slug problem with working with, in the initial stages, the type of, of biodiversity of species so that, that it somehow finds a, finds, a level, finds a manageable level? Have you, have yeah, you? I mean, we rarely use slug treatments. No, I don't mean using any slug treatment. No. I'm saying where there's a slug problem yeah. that, that, you, that you might try and encourage certain species of plant in so that eventually you get a type of biodiversity which, of plant species which means that the slugs then aren't so keen to be there. Yeah, I, I, the, the slug issue really is just around that, uh, those early phases. It's just when you're trying to... That's yeah. Yeah. yeah, so it's, it's just at that point. And you, know, you can manage an area of grassland before that in a way which will mean that you've got less of, shall we call it a burden, it's a bit of a pejorative term, but it, it's, uh, yeah, if, if you've got an older grassland, especially as I was talking about earlier, that's, that's perhaps got a lot of white pining blazes, more of a thatch, you're likely to get more slugs that are going to cause a bit more of a problem. So you can, you know, if you've raised it more heavily and over a period of time beforehand, you're likely to reduce, you know, reduce that sort of impact. Shall we leave it there, unless there's any <coughs> last burning questions? Can we give a big round of applause? <laughs>